Well, thank you very much for coming. Um, thanks to Bill and to Linda for inviting me here to, to give one of these talks. I understand there are a few of them each year, and I'm really delighted to be a person that's providing them. Um, I'm particularly delighted because I began research in the Salinas area in 1984, and I had three crew members, one of whom is Linda Pierce. So, <laughs> so there's a, a wonderful connectivity there. And um, I, I looked for pictures of her, too, and I have a couple of dark ones that didn't come out very well, so I, I decided not to embarrass her. But anyway, this is a, a very nice uh, link here. Um, I did add colonization. Bill asked me to talk about interesting things in the Salinas area, and since I've been working there since 1984, in my humble opinion, there's lots of interesting things to talk about. So um, I'll, I'll try to keep track of the time, and if I just am running way over, we'll, we'll lock one off. Um, I wanted to note that uh, although I've been working there for quite a number of years, uh, I'm also drawing on um, information from colleagues and students who have worked with me, who have worked independently, and uh, where I remember, I'll, I'll acknowledge you know, their, their particular contributions, but this isn't just my own work uh, by any means, and it's a whole lot more fun to do it with these other wonderful people. Oops, wrong way. So the Salinas area is, well first, who's been to the Salinas area? All right, so a reasonable number. Well, we're gonna get the rest of you out there, hopefully by the time I'm done. So the Salinas area is known as the Salinas province uh, because of these saline lakes that are to the northeast of um, the pueblos that I'll be talking about today. Uh, they're 99 and 44 one hundredths percent pure. You can just walk right out and pick up a piece of salt and eat it. Um, so, so one of the challenges um, of working on exchange, which is a topic I'll talk about partway through the talk, is that one of the primary products that would have been exchanged from the Salinas area is salt. They don't have to process it, unlike places in the eastern United States, and so we really have no record. Obviously salt doesn't preserve. So this would have been an important trade item, but, but it's one we can't really talk about more than that. The Salinas area, to orient you, here's Albuquerque, here is Santa Fe, here's the Rio Grande. So we are east of the Rio Grande area, and we're also east of the sort of last gasp of the mountains. So there are the Manzanos Mountains, and the Salinas Pueblos of the Manzanos Cluster are here. And then there's Chupadera Mesa, and the Salinas Pueblos of the Humanos Cluster, where I've done most of my work, um, are, are to the east of that. So um, the Salinas area is right at the edge of the Eastern Pueblo world. It makes it tremendously interesting. Um, there's essentially uh, an unmarked border that runs from Taos and Pickeries on through the Galisteo Basin and down through the Salinas area. And that was essentially the limit of Pueblo occupation, particularly after the 1300s. You, you get some people dribbling around the Sangre de Cristo, so and here's Pecos, that would be the other eastern border Pueblo. Um, so you get a little bit of earlier occupation out here, but really uh, when we're thinking about the larger Pueblos, the Salinas area is one of the, the farthest east. So one of the topics I'll be able to talk about today is relations with the Plains as well as relations with uh, the Rio Grande, the Rio Grande neighbors. Now to give you, uh, since you haven't been there, uh, a little bit of a sense of the landscape, uh, because we're at the edge of the plains, you've got um, grasslands, so there are extensive grasslands, and then the mesa, this is Chupadera Mesa, is wooded with pin and juniper. Uh, I'll be talking about connectivity as part of this uh, lecture today, and I just wanted to point out, so I, uh, this picture is taken from up at Gran Quivira, one of the Pueblos I'll talk about, and visually you are in contact, connected to the Manzanos, so, so you can see them from up there, and these are the Sandia Mountains, and so even though it appears remote, you're on the other side of the mountains, you're on the other side of the mesa, you're, you're actually connected visually um, with, uh, with the Rio Grande proper and certainly with your friends up in the Manzanos Mountains. Now this is Adriel Heise's photo, which is much more clear and much better. <laughs> uh, also to, to give you a sense of how would it, so, so this is Gran Quivira, uh, one of the large pueblos I'll talk about more in a minute, um, and most of this is juniper, so you've got some sage juniper, and then this is Chupadera Mesa uh, again. So um, some southwestern vegetation, but, but segueing also into the grasslands. Okay, um, before I get into the topics that I'm talking about, it's good to know something about the players, something a little bit about the cult culture history, the kinds of sites that were occupied, uh, because I'll be referring to those uh, throughout the talk. So our first um, clear occupation, the one that we have some uh, information on, is uh, the pit house period 
small number of pit houses in the AD 600s, but mostly it's 900 to 1200. So uh, for those of you who, who um, have background in southwestern archaeology, which is probably all of you, this is late. You would know that from the Colorado Plateau, for example, I, I mean, Chaco is going strong and, and actually you know, moving on uh, by this period of time. So you've got large pueblos being built in other places, um, and you have pit house occupations here as well as throughout the Rio Grande. So um, one of the reasons is that the kind of life way that pit houses are associated with, season, seasonal mobility, some corn farming, but also a lot of hunting and gathering, uh, persists in the Rio Grande much later than elsewhere, probably because the population density is relatively low. Now the low population density is a, a sort of an issue hanging out there uh, in the Rio Grande because it's, it's where everybody ends up, uh, as I'll show you in a little minute. Uh, by the 1300s. So it's a place where you can support a lot of people, but there weren't a lot of people there early on in prehistory. Okay, so we have uh, pit houses, don't know a lot about them. Not very many have been excavated, but they go later in time than is typical in the Southwest. Then we have something called the Hakal period, which again is unusual. There's, um, when, when you think about the pit house to Pueblo transition in the rest of the Southwest, you go from pit houses to masonry or adobe Pueblos. In the Salinas area, there is a period where um, you have Hakal buildings, which are uh, slab lines. So these are some slab linings uh, that would have been the footings for uh, an impermanent superstructure, and this is an example of a hakal. So it's wattle and daub. It's essentially sticks and thatch and mud. Um, so the wattle and daub room blocks would be about two to 10 rooms, and then you have between 20 and 50 of these room blocks on, on a hakal site. So there's a period of time where, where they're living above ground, but it still looks probably fairly mobile. Um, these are, are pretty easy to put up, and, uh, and they don't last as long, obviously, as an adobe or, or a masonry pueblo. So, um, so for roughly 200 years, obviously they don't stop pit houses one day and build the calls the next, but, but we segue into the Hakals and then um, into the early Pueblo period when we finally do get masonry and adobe Pueblos, very tightly clustered, plaza centered, room blocks around the plaza, sometimes multiple plazas. Uh, we ultimately get to the large Pueblos that I've worked on. Uh, this is, um, again, a heisey slide of a bow Pueblo, really nice and showing you uh, how large. So multiple plazas, plaza, 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 lots of room blocks around them, room blocks and plazas over here. And then here's Gran Quivira, one of the sites I've worked on, and less easy to see, but these are room blocks around a plaza. There are room blocks here around a plaza. This is Mount Seven that, um, Alden Hayes excavated back in the 60s, um, and then more plazas over here. So, so lots of room blocks, lots of plazas, sort of a much more open um, uh, layout. Early Pueblos would have been about 100 to 200 people. When they aggregate into these big Pueblos, we're talking about 600 to 1,000 people, just to get a sense of, of size. And then finally, before we get into the, the nitty gritty, um, the uh, Salinas area is colonized in the 1620s, and many of the pueblos uh, have large missions and, and conventos built on them. And that, if we have time, I'll get to that, uh, what happens, how the Salinas people respond to missionization uh, in the 1600s. The area is abandoned in the 1670s uh, due to epidemics, famine, and Apache raiding. And so people then move over the mountains to the Rio Grande, to Isleta and Sandia. Uh, and, and they're still there. So they didn't disappear. We still have them. Okay, so let's talk about stability. Um, the Salinas area is unique. You're not allowed to say very unique, kind of unique. So I'll just say it is unique <laughs> in, in its stability of population. So if you um, map out the population occupations in most areas of the Southwest, there is a buildup, a peak, and a drop. So this is Mimbrace as an example. This is the Rio Grande population as an example. Um, and if you look at Dean et al's publication, their chapter in 1994, there are lots of graphs like this, up, down, up, down. So people do well, and then things change, and then they move on. So here's Salinas. For 600 years, this is AD 1100, so, so we, we pick up with the Hakal period. We really don't, as I mentioned, we don't know much about the Pit House period. This, they're just flatlined, like nobody comes in, nobody goes out, that's it. Um, so, so that's something we have to explain. And it's not because the Salinas area is better watered. I mean, maybe you'd say, okay, well, it, it is lovely, but 
you know, it's not any better watered than anywhere else. So this is the Mimbrace uh, pattern of droughts. The very dark lines are droughts. The gray lines are, are lesser droughts. And so they have a history of droughts. Salinas has a history of droughts. And yet people remain. So, so often that boom and bust is tied to some sort of environmental challenge along with social challenges. And things get complex and, and people move on. Um, and that has not happened in the Salinas area. The other stability aspect about Salinas is, um, my, I guess people can see, is the immense stability in the location of the occupations. So for that 600 year period, and, and we haven't, I haven't figured out a very clear way of um, depicting this, but, but your, <clears throat> the red dots are uh, the pit houses and hakals, and the blue squares are the early pueblos, and the yellow squares are the large villages. And you see they're boom, 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 right on top of each other, and, and they literally are. We couldn't depict it that way because you wouldn't see the icons but they're in exactly the same places. So about five years ago, what I realized um, was going on was that <clears throat> there are water conditions that are unique in the Salinas area that make certain pieces of the landscape productive of water no matter whether there's a drought or not. So we have perched water table conditions. So you're getting a one slide on geology. That's it. Um, perched water tables are, are large bodies of water that are, are perched above the water table and that give out as springs or that can be dug into and, and uh, you can draw off the water in ditches. And artesian conditions, um, there are uh, uh, isostatic, there are pressures, differences in pressures that cause water to be drawn from the water table itself up onto the surface. And the Salinas area is characterized by both. So you've got <clears throat> some perched water tables, you've got artesian well conditions, but they're very localized. And so that is what has led to this high localization of um, where people lived on that landscape. OK, so the Salinas area is perfect. And yet, no, nobody comes in. So we can see why nobody leaves, because there is no more secure water supply. It's not affected by rainfall. These are much larger bodies of water. So, so you don't get that up and down and availability of rain for, for um, I mean, availability of water for farming or for drinking or whatever. But we also noticed that people don't move in. And so um, that's something we need to explain. And what makes uh, it even more interesting, <clears throat> excuse me, that people didn't move in is the fact that the whole center of gravity of population in the Southwest switches from more in the Western Pueblo area to the Rio Grande in the matter of, of a century or two. So these are donated by Desert Archaeology. This is the coalescent communities um, uh, databases. And these are essentially like topo contours. So, so high population here, higher population here, you know, somewhat high population here. This is 1250 to 1300. By 1450, almost everybody is here. It's got Hopi, Zuni, Akama. But basically, everybody's here. Salinas is this little blob. So, so you have this buildup of population, 10,000 plus people migrating into the Rio Grande, and you still don't have them into the, in the Salinas area. And so that leads us to the next topic, which is conflict. You know, clearly, there, there's something keeping people out, because this would be a, a good place to live. All right, so um, the Hakal, this is, it gives you a nice sense of the Hakal villages. Uh, so, so there are separate little room blocks. These are all the Hakals at LA-97. This map is from Matt Chamberlain. And in the late 1200s, early 1300s, as people are moving into the Rio Grande, those Hakal communities, nice and scattered, no neighbors, no people to worry about, come together in a very tightly enclosed Pueblo. So that's an early Pueblo. And that is not just typical of LA-97. We have a whole series of other sites that Matt studied. So these little dots are simply showing you where the Hakals were. And boom, late 1200s, early 1300s, into these Pueblos. So, so there is a settlement pattern change that suggests that people are concerned because they're, um, the plazas are inside, the walls surround the plaza. So, so you've essentially built yourself a fortress. Uh, a second aspect has to do with settlement location, or second line of evidence. And that is, <clears throat> excuse me, that these early Pueblos are largely up on Chupadera Mesa. So that what they've done is move to the heights. Pit houses were below. Some of the earliest early Pueblos were below. But most of them are up here. Um, so, so you have line of sight connections and, and visibility into you know, who's coming up against you. So, um, 
<clears throat> okay, so we've got settlement location. We have uh, very good information on fortification. So this is Frank's ruin, one that um, Alison Ratman and Matt Chamberlain worked on. Began as an adobe pueblo, and uh, the adobe pueblo burned. We excavated over here. I, excava I excavated right there. They gave me a little pit. I was there for three days. They said, oh, there's a pot hunter's pit. Go look at it. I found the adobe wall, so, <laughs> and then I left. But, uh, but anyway, so it initially was an adobe pueblo and fairly thick wall surrounding the outside. Uh, it was burned and they built a massive masonry wall, and, which was why we didn't even realize there was an adobe wall there because on the outside we could see the masonry, huge thing. And, uh, and it was only coming at it from the inside of the pueblo that we realized that there was a, um, <clears throat> an earlier adobe wall. So fortification increasing in the um, robusticity of the fortification, but it didn't work completely. So Frank's ruin is actually quite badly burned. Uh, and this, it's hard to capture it, but this shows you burning in one of the rooms. Masonry room, we had burning in an adobe room, burning in a masonry room. Uh, rooms filled with charred corn. So, so corn, you know, is just, they had storage rooms that were burned. Burned beams. Um, so, so this Pueblo and three others that have been tested by uh, Matt and, and Allison and Julie Solometto um, have shown burning. So clearly there is a, a fair amount of conflict up there. Now we don't know who the perpetrators are. So um, th there's no, you know, arrow with uh, that looks like somebody's special arrow or anything like that. So, so we don't know if it's internal conflict. We don't know if it is outsiders, you know, people coming into the Rio Grande and trying to move into the Salinas area and not able to. Um, but we do know that the period of the 1300s is, is uh, quite, uh, apparently quite violent. Okay, but in the 1400s, uh, things, and, and this seems to be the case across the Rio Grande, uh, there seems to be a cessation of violence, and that's when people move off Chupadera Mesa into those large pueblos that, that I showed you, the ones with the multiple room blocks, um, and the ones that have roughly a thousand people or so in them. So, so they're moving actually closer to those water tables, closer to uh, land that could be irrigated by those water tables. And what we see then is a fluorescence of interaction beyond um, where, uh, where people are. So the Salinas area had modest exchange relations with the Rio Grande, modest with the Zuni area, a um, little bit of White Mountain Redware, a little bit of glazes, uh, glazewares from the Rio Grande, a little bit of obsidian. But, but in the 1400s, there is a, a real um, uptick in interaction. So on connectivity, we're going to look at Plains Pueblo interaction, and then we'll look at, at relations with their fellow Puebloans uh, across the Southwest. Okay, so who knew that the Italian farmers were paying attention to the Central Plains? But anyway, <laughs> this is, <laughs> you know, I'm just looking around, I need to show the plains. <laughs> but anyway, um, somewhere several centuries before the 1400s, Athabascan speakers from, uh, from Canada, for, from Canadian provinces, um, well, they weren't provinces then, but from that part of Canada, uh, begin to migrate south. And, and there's, um, there is discussion over whether it's, it's a purely plains migration, whether it's a, a, a front range, a sort of Rockies uh, migration, but nonetheless, by the 1400s, you have Athabascan populations in the Southern Plains. So these are the ancestors of the uh, Apache and the Navajo. Um, and that couldn't have come at a better time. Uh, well, here, so here's the plains. I, I actually worked on some of these hunter-gatherer sites for my dissertation before 1982. And uh, so perfect bison country. So, so this is where in the late prehistoric period you get buildup of bison herds, you get a lot of hunter-gatherers, um, especially bison hunters on the southern plains. And um, they, are, they have mobile habitation, so they're living in teepees, and they have dogs about the size of uh, German shepherds that pull travois. And I have another picture that shows one, a, a dog hooked up to a travois. So, so they are mobile and they can carry stuff. And that is, ends up being quite helpful to the eastern border pueblos. Because in the eastern border pueblos, um, the long-term occupation of that landscape, so remember they've been there you know, at least since 900, has ultimately led to a significant decline in the availability of antelope. 
So I don't have a lot of charts, but, but this one is showing you, this is the early Pueblo period, and there's actually a fairly high frequency for, for the Southwest in general of antelope uh, in the Salinas area uh, in the early Pueblo period. By the 1400s, which is what Middle uh, relates to, um, that the antelope availability has declined and they're having to rely a lot more on rabbits, you know, so you have to go down pretty far. At the same time, we see that the frequency of bison bone in the Grand Kivira Middens, hardly anything there in the early Pueblo period. By the 1400s, it increases dramatically, and it's, um, uh, it's mostly ribs. So, so these aren't bison that are anywhere near Grand Kivira. They're being hunted farther away. Uh, the r racks of ribs are being butchered off. Those can be dried and put on the back of, of a dog, or at least portions of them can, can be put on the back of a dog. So the meat is coming in dry without any bones. We don't see it. Um, but some of it luckily is on bones, uh, ribs in particular, that, um, uh, that show up in the midden. So, so as the uh, local hunted game, the large game, is declining, then uh, it appears that trade with the plains is helping to make up for that. Now we have other evidence that, uh, that there's interaction with the plains in the 1400s. These are artifacts from Grand Kivira, these uh, two sets from uh, Alden Hayes' excavations and this from ours. So we have, uh, or what he excavated were pendants made of uh, shell that, uh, that comes from the plains. So these are Lampsilis and then they're also Unio shells. Uh, and this is a beveled knife, so a particular plains form of um, stone tool made of alabates dolomite, which comes from the Texas Panhandle. So you get alabates material at Grand Kibera made in the form of planes. So they're not making locally, the planes people are bringing it in. And also this is, um, okay, so, uh, so bison skulls. So here I am saying, oh, well, they're walking 100 kilometers off the planes, and then I show you a bison skull. Uh, which, which are large and heavy. But, but what they had done, this is actually at the base of a burn kiva on a, a kiva floor. What they had done to make it portable um, is to cut out the back of the skull. So essentially you've got enough structure. We think this is probably a mask. There's enough bone structure and the horns were there to, um, uh, to, to give the, the mask structure, but not so much that it would have been too heavy to put on the back of a dog or, or somebody's back. So, so interestingly, um, ritually, the, the Pueblos are incorporating some aspects of the bison. Uh, this mask is in a kiva. And then out on the plains, um, we find uh, materials, Pueblo materials at what are clearly plains hunter-gatherer sites. So ceramics, these are glazewares uh, from the Tierra Blanca sites that I worked on, and some obsidian and some turquoise. So, so we have evidence of, of this interaction going both ways uh, in the archaeological record. So what we're looking at, so here is this, uh, so here's a dog and here's a travois uh, attached to it. And, and apparently what the, the Spanish, early Spanish explorers who see the Plains Indians coming to the Pueblos in the fall to, to trade the products of the bison hunt, I uh, describe <clears throat> maybe uh, sometimes a hundred dogs, so a whole long line of these dogs bringing material off the Plains uh, and into the Pueblo area. So um, this interdependence involves uh, bison products, meat, fat, hides, a lot of things we can't really track uh, coming in, in return primarily for corn. In the, the ethno-historic documents from the 1600s, they, they describe corn being the primary product. It's not something that we can see archeologically, so the ceramics and the obsidian tell us that they were exchanging, but it's really the corn that, that was uh, what they were interested in, and these would have been, so here's Grand Kivira, so the fields below it in the, those artesian well conditions um, would, uh, would have been quite productive. Okay, so we also have um, not only a, a, a blossoming of exchange with the plains, but a blossoming of exchange with uh, the Pueblo world. And in the Salinas area, we have a number of different kinds of materials that, uh, that we can trace, that we can source to other parts of the Rio Grande or where a documentary evidence suggests they're coming from. So uh, glazeware ceramics, I'll show you a picture in a minute. 
Um, large numbers of them show up in the Salinas area. Uh, so the Salinas Pueblos start making their own, but, but they still import from the Galisteo Basin. Some turquoise, a little bit of pigment. Obsidian we have sourced uh, to the Jemez Mountains, uh, so the Jemez Obsidian flows. We, we obviously, uh, cotton doesn't preserve in the archaeological record. These are open air sites, um, so, so it decays. But every kiva that has been excavated in the Salinas Pueblo sites has, uh, has loom holes and they're not growing cotton there. We don't have cotton seeds, we don't have cotton pollen. It's just uh, not conducive, probably not warm enough for cotton production. And we do know that the Rio Abajo Pueblo, south of Albuquerque, were producing con uh, cotton at the time of contact. So it looks like a fair amount, and obviously cotton is light, uh, cotton is being drawn into uh, the Salinas Pueblo area. Now the, the tricky thing is, is what goes out, um, because you don't find Salinas stuff. Uh, at all these other places, and probably because it is perishable. So we're just imagining what, what's going out. I, I mentioned salt before, um, so the, the Salinas area is, is, um, has this high concentration of salt, very not available elsewhere in the Rio Grande. Uh, corn would be going to the plains, unlikely that it's going anywhere else. These are all corn producers. Uh, but bison hides. Uh, are a likely trade item. So let's just look at some of these things. So bison hide, the salt, <clears throat> being traded out for glazeware ceramics from the, Rio, uh, from the Galisteo Basin, obsidian and, and cotton. Um, the hides business, I actually, we have a little bit of documentary data for, um, and that is that when the Spaniards first uh, reach Hopi, the Hopi Pueblo, so as far west as you can get at the time of contact in terms of the Pueblo world, um, all of the Hopi men are wearing um, bison hides, so, so, so bison robes, and, and there are no bison near the Hopi area at all. I mean, all the bison are in the southern plains at that point in, in prehistory or the protohistoric period. So clearly hides were a, a huge commodity that were being exchanged uh, from the eastern border of Pueblo to the west, uh, but unfortunately not something that, that preserves archaeologically. Okay, any questions at this point? I'm gonna, like, I think I'm running through this. <laughs> Is there any other salt area around other than the Salinas? No, no, so, so, so there's a whole series of salt lakes, um, but they're all in this one area, yeah, yeah, yeah. Are there any mineral springs there, or anything like, I don't know how close it is to C or C, and I know that further south, mm -hmm. Well, not now. Our, our problem is that um, the, the water table, so all this area was, was ranched and farmed and, uh, and pumped. And so the water, which is another reason I didn't realize there were perched water tables in artesian conditions there historically. So, so the water table has dropped so much that, that anything like that um, is no longer visible. And I haven't seen anything in the like, early 1900s documents to suggest that that's there. Yeah. Yeah. Salt's usually not a good thing for agriculture, so can these localize and how do they grow? Those are highly localized. Most of the, um, uh, the, the land around the large pueblos is, is sandy, uh, and, and it's, so, so, so the salt uh, basins themselves are, are, are localized, and, and people don't actually live near them. The pueblos are, are some distance from them. But yeah, no, that would definitely be problematic. Okay, well, we'll go into the <coughs> colonial period. So in the, um, so in, in 1598, the, uh, the Spaniards uh, set, established a colony in the northern Rio Grande. So, so initially near San Juan Pueblo and then ultimately by 1600 down in Santa Fe. And by the 16 teens, uh, they are establishing missions in, in the Salinas Pueblo area. Um, and we have a quote from a Salinas Pueblo person that, so, so after the Pueblo revolt in 1680, um, the Spanish government in Mexico City was trying to determine, well, what is going on? Why, why did the, uh, the Pueblos throw the Spaniards out? And I think this <clears throat> gives you, this quote gives you a sense of the, uh, the burden of the Spanish presence um, at that time. So the documents tell us that, uh, so, so this is specific to the Salinas area. There is a tremendous amount of resource extraction, uh, including pinon nuts. The, the area is highly productive of pinon, and actually pinon was an important 
uh, dietary commodity for the Salinas Pueblo people themselves. So they're collecting pinion nuts, those go to Santa Fe or down to the mines in, in northern Mexico. Antelope hides, um, so, so tribute is taken. There's a, a, an encomienda system established in New Mexico where soldiers are, are given um, portions of the landscape, including the people living on those portions of the landscape, and they are allowed to extract tribute, uh, usually in corn and cotton, but because cotton was not grown in the Salinas area, uh, antelope hides could be substituted. So, um, so large numbers of hides, these go to haul ore uh, out of the mines, silver mines in northern Mexico, Peral, uh, and then salt. So there's a lot of harvesting, processing of resources that leave the Salinas area. And then people, um, uh, the men are used to <clears throat> uh, move uh, materials around the Salinas area, take them to Santa Fe, and take them to northern Mexico. And in fact, I, I don't have um, information in this, but I'll just mention it. Uh, physical anthropologists who worked with uh, um, burials, inhumations uh, at Gran Quivira, um, documented that the um, muscle markings in men that relate to carrying labor uh, increased dramatically. So, so, so the physical evidence of carrying heavy loads among men increases dramatically in the historic period. Okay, so what, um, what Salinas presents us with in looking at it, sort of the responses, the impact and responses of Spanish colonization is an opportunity to look at three different um, Ex local experiences of missionization. So I've worked at all three of these sites, and, and Billy Graves co-directed that by Pueblo Blanco, but Quarai is missionized in the 1620s and remains missionized until abandonment in the 1670s. Gran Quivira isn't missionized until 1660, and Pueblo Blanco just has a little chapel on it. So, so we'll look at these three, but the, one of the questions that I've, I've addressed in my research in the Salinas area is, um, is the variation in Spanish presence, does that result in differences in impact on Pueblo lifeways and repeat Pueblo responses to Spanish missionization? So here's Quaray, um, large church and convento plunked right next to um, the, the Pueblo room blocks. That's uh, the Spanish Inquisition was positioned at Quaray, so uh, there, there's pretty significant <laughs> Spanish presence there. Gran Quivira actually had a, a, an initial little mission right here uh, that was built in the 1620s. The guy stayed there a year, said, ugh, these people are intractable, and left. And he, went to, he went to Zuni and he was killed there, so he probably would have been, <laughs> been better off staying here. <clears throat> anyway, being the intractable people that they were, uh, they, they, uh, nobody went back, so no friars went back to, uh, to Gran Quivira until the 1660s, and this whole um, installation there, the, the, the church and the convento were built in the 1660s. So there's a 40 year period where there are no Spaniards living um, at Gran Quivira. Then at Pueblo Blanco, I, I don't have any aerial of that, so this is sort of an uninspiring <laughs> view of the rubble at Pueblo Blanco, but uh, we do have a map. And there was a little chapel that was built in the plaza at Pueblo Blanco, and then it was burned and then it was rebuilt. But, but what this means is that really hardly any uh, Spaniards, any friars, or anybody else who were Spanish uh, came out to Pueblo Blanco. Okay, so what are uh, some of the responses? We'll look here briefly at antelope hunting and uh, at corn and the data that we have concerning um, what, what choices different Pueblos made. So the Pueblos had a choice between, somewhat of a choice, between continuing to hunt the local antelope. Something I should mention is that um, the Spaniards uh, became involved in the plains trade and so that, that was cut off. You see a decrease in bison bone in the Pueblo middens. There's no longer direct plains Pueblo exchange. So, uh, so they're either going to rely on local antelope or uh, they'll rely on sheep or cattle, which were both uh, present. And there are large flocks of sheep uh, that were herded in the Salinas area. Uh, the cows don't, didn't look like that, but you know, what can I do? <laughs> <There's>, <laughs> represents a cow. <laughs> it probably is from Wisconsin or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So I'll do better next time. <laughs> uh, so, so the missionized Pueblo, so, so Quarai is the on-stage context. They've got Spaniards living in their community from the 1620s on through to abandonment. And, and what we see in Quarai is a reorganization of the economy. So they shift to um, some reliance on European domesticates, especially sheep. They were probably the ones herding the sheep. Very large sheep flocks held 
by the, the Spaniards. And um, we see that the, in the Pueblo middens, the, the middens on the Pueblo side of the site, they, that they're getting the whole sheep. So, so apparently they're, they're given you know, their own sheep, uh, or at least a whole dead sheep. To, to consume. Um, so it's only at Quarai that we see a really significant shift to reliance on European domestic animals for food uh, as opposed to continuing to hunt. And in fact, there's a reduction in hunting, there is a reduction in gathering of, uh, say, cacti and other sorts of plants. So, so a lot of Quarai labor is focused on the mission and is being corralled by the mission um, <clears throat> for its own purposes. Now it, non-missionized Gran Quivira. So, so you don't have the Spaniards present, but you do have to pay tribute. So all of these pueblos have to pay tribute, whether there is a Spanish mission active in your pueblo or not. You're paying to the soldier. Uh, and you also end up paying to the governor periodically too. So, um, so what we see there is that Gran Quivira increased corn production. What uh, our, our botanical um, analyses show is an increase in row number uh, of the corn cobs and so essentially the corn cobs are getting bigger. They're selecting for corn with larger numbers of rows and that gives them more production per, per unit area. So they're increasing corn production. Uh, as I mentioned there's a reduction in plains trade. The Spaniards get involved and they're on um, they're not only involved, but it becomes dangerous for the uh, plains people to come to the Pueblos because then the Spaniards uh, take them captives and uh, enslave them. So, so there's a lot of falling apart of the Plains Pueblo trade. Um, with the absence of bison, uh, then what we find is, uh, is entire cattle. And cattle were very much wealth for, for the friars. So, so the Pueblo people living at Quarai didn't eat much beef at all. And neither did the, the friars. Cattle were for export to Mexico to be able to buy the vestments and the gold chalices and whatever. Um, so, so what we think, and yet you get whole cattle uh, at, in the historic period middens at Gran Quivira. So what we suspect, because the way of ranching cattle uh, in, in New Mexico at the time was simply to let them roam. You just let them out on the grasslands. You herd the sheep, but you let the cattle roam. Is that Gran Quivirans were, were picking them off and, and just bringing the cattle back and consuming them on their own. Okay, now uh, Pueblo Blanco, the one that was uh, the visita, who that didn't have much in the way of Spanish presence at all, we see a marked increase in antelope hunting. Now they were the best position. So, so even um, in that aggregation period, uh, given their position on the landscape, they had not overhunted the local antelope. And that Pueblo seems to be the appropriate one to increase hunting in order to get the hides for tribute. Uh, so we see a marked increase in antelope hunting. We see almost no European domesticates. There are two uh, pig toes, two pig phalanges that came out of our excavations at, at Pueblo Blanco. So, so they completely ignore European domesticates. They're certainly hunting enough uh, antelope to acquire enough meat. We suspect that um, that additional hunting has to do with gaining hides. We actually see a reduction in corn production. Um, very tiny corn kernels. So, so they're not putting a lot of effort into uh, the production of corn in this uh, colonial period. And, and as I mentioned before, as with Gran Quivira, reduction in plains trade. Okay, um, so, so the, the, remember the Spaniards bring soldiers with them. So, so these tribute payments have to be made. You have to um, meet Spanish demands, and the Pue Salinas Pueblo sort of organized their economic activities in response to, to the necessity to give corn and, and, um, and hides and tribute. But they also resist the uh, Spanish um, efforts to eradicate the Pueblo religion. And we can see uh, efforts at that eradication at Gran Quivira in terms of the late prehistoric kivas, protostoric kivas being burned. So every protostoric kiva that's been excavated at Gran Quivira has, has been burned, which is something that the documents say the Spanish did. Um, so, so this Pueblo ritual practice and knowledge sort of has to go underground. And um, a really nice study of the uh, glazeware ceramics in the Salinas area by Jeannie Mobley Tanaka has documented that in the on-stage context, so Abo and Korai both had uh, uh, missions right there from the 1620s to abandonment. Uh, so you go from producing very 
clear, nicely made glaze bowls with clear iconography. These glazes generally have some sort of bird iconography on them, not only in the Salinas area, but across the Rio Grande. So, you know, that, that's been going on for a couple hundred years. And in the historic period, you see um, a, a, a masking. This is Jeannie's argument, a masking of icons. So she thinks that may still be sort of a, a hint at a bird beak. Um, you also see a, a simplification of design. So where the Spaniards are watching and, and the glazewares were made in a boa quarai, uh, you see a reduction in the, um, the iconographic content, or at least the visible iconographic content of uh, on the ceramics. And then in the Gran Quivira area, the area where the Spaniards weren't until the 1660s, um, you see instead a massive proliferation of iconography on vessels, on, on, on uh, pots. And I'll have a couple of other uh, examples in a minute. So for an, a very long time, <laughs> Chupadero black on white was decorated with geometric motifs. So you have these hatching and you have these swirls and so on. So this is a remarkably stable ceramic and, and for, for hundreds of years. Chupadero <laughs> black on white is made like that. These vessels look like that. In the uh, colonial period, they, this sort of um, decoration is dropped in favor of very specific icons. So very specific Kachina dancers, uh, a little narrative here. I don't know if you can see this, but this is a guy who's running away from bears. So, so there's a bear up here, which you can't see very well, and then there's some bears down here. And, and he's looking back at them, and he's dropped his bow and arrow, and he's running away. So, <laughs> but if, uh, um, here we have, this is the morning star god. Uh, this is another um, sort of iconic uh, person. Feathers, textiles, uh, more textiles over here. And each of the Tabira pots, so, so what was Tabira black on white? Same paste, same paints, you know, so no change in the technology. But this uh, more iconic uh, material is called Tabira black on white. So to be a black and white, no two vessels are alike. And what seems to be happening is that the ritual knowledge um, that people have is now being sort of spread across the, the Pueblo, um, perhaps so, as a way to teach children. So if you're walking to get water, you know, you have this canteen on your back. Um, it's being made more visible at a time when Pueblo religion is under assault. So, so, so my argument has been that that shift from a geometric style to a, a very iconographically rich and um, series of unique vessels is a way of communicating information about ritual practice, ritual garments, um, important beings uh, to a, a wider group within the Pueblo as, as their religion is being uh, attacked. Okay, so 1670s, um, uh, famine, uh, epidemics, Apache raiding all caused the Salinas area to be abandoned. They moved to the Pueblo of Sandia, the Pueblo of Isleta. And actually, um, during the Pueblo Revolt, some of the members of Pueblo of Isleta moved south to Isleta del Sur, and so some descendants of the Grand Quivira, of the Salinas area, are, are likely uh, there as well. Um, so, so they certainly remain, and you, can visit Salinas Pueblo Missions National Monument uh, where you can see a bow, quarai, and Gran Quivira. Um, and there are actually some, some excellent uh, museums at each of those uh, places. So I hope you will. <laughs> Thanks very much. <laughs> so I'm happy to take as many questions as you have. I, I tend to sort of gallop. <laughs> <laughs> through my talk. So if there's anything that's unclear, then, then I'm happy to, uh, or, or questions that you have, I'm happy to answer them. Yeah. Is there anything that you can say about interactions among the Salinas Pueblos? I know there's more than one language group there, at least that's my understanding. Do they, can they compete with each other? Well, like this, this is Billy Graves' dissertation. <laughs> So, um, do you, would you like to answer that? that uh, well, it, it's been years, but uh, <laughs> that, um, yeah, the, the two clusters that Kate showed, there's uh, uh, two different language 
groups. Um, um, oh, I'm blanking on it. T1. T yeah, yeah, T1 and Tom Pira. Uh, and those um, generally, not, not exactly, but generally sort of map onto those clusters. So the northern folks spoke T1, it looks like, mm -hmm. and the southern folks uh, spoke Tom Pira. Mm -hmm. Um, there's some differences in um, that that make those two clusters look sort of like <coughs> uh, maybe something like um, sort of different ethnicities or 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 something like that sort of uh, uh, cultural differences between those two areas. So you see that in language. You see it in ceramics. Uh, the southern pueblos, the Humanos cluster, have that old black on white tradition. Uh, from the 1400s on, um, the Tabira black and white, and the folks up north, Quarai, Abo, uh, and those pueblos don't uh, seem to uh, uh, continue on with those old white traditions. So there's these, these kind of you know subtle uh, sort of hints that there are these uh, pretty probably <coughs> significant cultural differences within the area. Right, and, and things then move. So 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 they they drop Tabira black and white. Um, but then become the suppliers of the glaciers, so, so, so the Montanos Mountains. Um, and, uh, and, and Gran Quivira um, seems to have more uh, ritual architecture, uh, many more kivas um, than, than the other Humanos Pueblos, but, but we don't get a sense of competition. You know, I, I think it's more that, that, that uh, I, I, I don't know if the, like a, a, a mother-daughter Pueblo um, model is, is, is correct, but, but one possibility is, is that Gran Quivira, which also produces the Chubadera and the Chubira, is really the central Pueblo in the Humanos cluster, and that the others, which are, are all pretty large still, the late prehistoric ones, um, have some sort of ritual connection to it. So, so you don't get a sense of competition, at least not overt. Yeah, it's like these places are sort of autonomous, that's the way I always thought of it. So they're, they're all doing, you know, a, a lot of the they, same sorts of you know, long distance exchange and things like that, uh, and in different places, different communities uh, focus on different uh, long distance connections mm -hmm. or sort of economic, local economic zones. Right. Yeah. There isn't dominance right. by one. Yeah. Yes. Um, I'm thinking about the you're talking about the population stability mm -hmm. and the size of the good prior to them coming together. Oh, it, it's a good question. We um, we don't have uh, none of the hakals have been excavated, and the uh, the early pueblos, the the, the data are, are just coming out. So, um, so, so for example, in plants, I, I don't know if there are plant areas or plant resources up on the mesa that they no longer uh, no longer acquire. Um, so, so the answer right now is that I don't know. One of the questions that I have of of that record. Is you know it, it's interesting to me that um, that in the early Pueblo period you know you have a fair amount of, of antelope and then it drops off in the middle Pueblo period. What I wonder is whether earlier on it was mule deer because mule deer are quite rare in in these in both the early uh, Pueblo and, and in the later prehistoric Pueblo. But but they're abundant on Chupadera Mesa today. So um, so there's the possibility that mule deer were uh, were somewhat decimated during the Hakal period and that by the time we get to the early masonry. Those um, they're only relying on antelope, which are much smaller. Mule deer would be a better, you know, more productive animal to go after. Uh, but beyond that, I don't know. Yeah. Was there blaze of lead blaze? Yes. Mm -hmm. And and actually, um, so Deb Huntley has has done some interesting work on lead isotopes, and the source of lead for for the Salinas area is different than the Galisteo Basin. So they were able independently to produce glaze wares without relying on the Galisteo Basin. Yeah? Um, I assume that the Spanish had, a, at some point, a fairly dramatic impact on the population or the, uh, or the demographic uh, demography of the region. Do you see that coming in prior to the Spanish? I mean, was the disease coming in or, or well after the Spanish? Where, where do you see that population? Uh, um, well, it, it's hard to say. So, so we have uh, those large pueblos, only very small 
amounts of which, you know, tiny fractions of a percent of which have been excavated. So we don't have a handle on, on either the growth or the contraction at this point. Nobody's you know, done a series of tests or anything like that to be able to, to figure out um, what the Spanish impact was. The only uh, <clears throat> piece of data that we do have is that one of the Humanos Pueblos, Pueblo Colorado, uh, was abandoned um, in the late 1500s. And, and you know, whether that's related to, to an early presence of epidemics and, and, and they consolidate, I, we really don't know. But, but that's the only, that's the scale at which we can see impact, if a pueblo is completely abandoned or not. When, when the Spanish, excuse me, when, when Don, uh, Oñate gets there, he, he's still talking about thousands. So I, I doubt there was too much of a pre-colonization impact, but, but we don't have a good handle on post. Do you think there would be any evidence that survives of animal drives? Because with more people, mm -hmm. it might well be that it was easier to take that load than the uh, more scattered mule deer. Mule deer, right. Um, we don't, they probably would have been brush. We don't, there's been enough survey um, in the area that nothing like stone alignments or anything permanent uh, has been found. and. <clears throat> Another way of looking at that would be to look at the age structure, and, and they're not bringing the skulls back. So we don't get mandibles, we don't get the cranium. So, so we can't see if we have a catastrophic kill. Yeah, yeah, no, that'd be interesting. I don't know. You, you, you mentioned burning the kiva at, uh, at uh, Las Hermanas. What about the two kivas, the one at Abo and the one in Corai and the Conventos? Do you think those were built by the Franciscans or not? Oh, uh, I, I have no idea. <laughs> so so what, what is it, it, right in the courtyard, and I, I guess if I could find the aerial, you'd, you'd see it, it, it both at Bo and Quarai, there, there are kivas right in the courtyard of, of the mission complex. And so there are all kinds of explanations. One is that, in fact, the friars were, were trying to accommodate uh, some aspects of Pueblo religion. I sort of doubt that. Um, and, and one is that it, it's sort of a, a resistance, you know, maybe there's a time when, when they're not, not paying much attention. I, well, it's not in the courtyard, they're actually in the convento themselves. Okay, all right. And, 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 yeah. and the was <coughs> insistent that they were trying to accommodate the religion, <coughs> which, you know, Catholicism has a way of sometimes doing that. And not that they were allowing, uh, you know, indigenous ceremonies to take place in them, but architecturally, Here's a room that you could be comfortable in. Right, and, and that's perfectly possible. Um, what, what we see at Grand Kivira is, is just the annihilation of the kivas. I mean, just burning and burning and burning. So, um, and we don't have an example of that, but, but the friars aren't there until, until much later. Uh, yeah, that's certainly possible. Yeah. I'm wondering what, what you found in the way of um, trade beads or metal crucifixes or, uh, I mean, is there uh, any, any of that aspect of Spanish <clears throat> in the life? Um, n not in, in the record that we have. Uh, so I, I, um, none of the projects I've been on has actually excavated the convento. Um, and so earlier projects have, you know, without screening, so, so some of these small things wouldn't have been, been recovered. There's not a lot there. I mean, certainly, given the amount of excavation that's been done in the um, uh, in, in the churches and the conventos, not a lot of material. That uh, is it something to remember um, is that it is a six-month journey from Mexico City to to the Rio Grande, and so so these would be year and a half. So they journey six months from Mexico City, spend six months in, in the Rio Grande area, gearing, you know, distributing and then gearing up again, and then it'd be six months back. So, um, so it wasn't easy. They were at the end of the supply chain. It wasn't easy to get materials up there. Yeah. What, what is the interest of uh, Sandia and Isleta in these ancestral places today? And do you have any interactions with those pueblos in your work? Right, when we were at Pueblo Blanco, um, so, so, so the, the interests are, are somewhat different, partly because of who's still alive. So, so in, in the Isleta area, there are, or at, at Isleta Pueblo, um, there are, are a number of male elders, uh, and, and several of them came to, to Pueblo Blanco 
and toured it. Uh, we, we had some interesting objects to, to, to look at, but, but they also toured around. And they, they spoke Tiwa, and they talked amongst themselves and, and seemed interested. <laughs> but but, but they're, I mean, they, they were just sort of absorbing the information for, for their own use. Um, at Sandia, there, uh, there are no longer um, the, at that level of uh, male ritual specialists. And so the people who came from Sandia Pueblo were, were the women. Uh, and they were interested in educating the children about their heritage. And so it was really two different kinds of conversation. One about, you know, this is the history and, of our people, and the other, uh, a, a Tiwa conversation about what, what they were observing. All right, well, thank you very much.